I'd like to welcome everyone to our service this afternoon. Uh, we have an item of business that we need to vote on in our bulletin. We have some transfers. If you look under the section in your bulletin that says church business, we have a list of uh, transfers that are transferring out, but also a list of transfers of those who are coming in. And uh, I'm wondering if anyone who's on the uh, transfer in side of this is here this here today and could and would be willing to stand up because as we uh, part of our tradition here is to welcome you as you're transferring in and um, you see there that um, we have uh, two from the Coquila family from Sligo Gloria Lee from Berea Temple, Hans Olsen, and Enid Thomas is, uh, okay, there we are. And uh, so who, I need a, a motion and a second to uh, approve these transfers. There's a motion, there's a second. All in favor, raise your hand and welcome. And I'd like to invite the elders that are here present to go and welcome the new members and uh, we are so glad that you're a part of our congregation now, and thank you for, for, joining, uh, for joining our church. So if you uh, don't recognize uh, someone that's new and has joined today, make sure you, you say hello afterwards today. At this time, I'm going to invite Milka to come forward, and we're going to sing together in a time of praise. I want to officially welcome you to Beltville Seventh-day Adventist Church this Sabbath morning and let you know that we are honored that you're here with us today and that you chose to worship here. We know that there are many other churches in the area you, that you could have gone to, yet you chose to be here with us and we consider that a blessing. I wanna take just a few minutes to explain the safety features for the choice that you have made this morning of being here. First of all, our destination is heaven. Our pilot is God the Father, and he has many years of experience. God the Son, who has been there, done that, and has a t-shirt that says, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God the Holy Spirit will provide for you the comfort that you need should this trip get a little bumpy. He is at your disposal as long as you ask for him. Should you have any electronics that make sound, we ask at this time that you please put them on silence since they may become uh, and interfere with our uninterrupted connection when we are seeking for this morning. Please note that there are four exits. There are three in the back, one in the front, and if you must exit, we ask that you do so as quietly as possible. If you haven't already found the laboratories, they're on the other side of the vessel. There's also a location on the other side for our younger, rest, uh, our younger passengers, so they, should they get a little restless. We doubt that there will be any pressure changes, but if you do feel a pressure change, we ask that you please close your eyes, remain calm, Take a deep breath and ask for the Holy Spirit to provide for you the comfort and the peace that only heaven can provide. No beverages or snacks will or should be served in the main cabin. We pray you find today's journey a memorable one, one that will help you join our family, lift the name of Jesus up on high, praise him for the promise of heaven, Open our eyes that we could see him and draw us closer to his heart. And welcome to Beltsville. It is time to sing. And we're going to start with a little song called Family. And we're going to sing it twice. We'll sing it the first time. And then I'm going to ask that the church members stand up and greet each other as well as our visitors. Family. Family. So 
let's welcome each other. you to join me singing Lord I lift your name on high Jesus gave his life for me and gave me the opportunity to look forward to heaven. We will sing three stanzas and I ask that for the last chorus you please watch the hands.
shore There in those mansions sublime And it's because of that wonderful day When at the cross I believe Riches eternal and blessings supernal From His precious hands I receive Heaven came down and glory filled my soul there's some sopranos out there. We're going to try that chorus again. Now you have the idea. So take a deep breath and come on up with me, okay? Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were to get to heaven. I really can't wait. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. stand as we sing in the heart of God. Where sin cannot molest 
place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God a place where we are safe your meet near to the heart of God oh Jesus blessed Good afternoon, everyone. I invite you as far as possible to kneel with me as we pray. We thank you, Lord, this morning for the opportunity to come together and worship you in this house of worship. Lord, we owe you so much. We thank you for our families and for our homes and for our health, and most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus who lived and died, that we may have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for freedom, freedom to worship this morning freely here. There are so many people in the world, Lord, who do not, do not enjoy that freedom, and we pray for them and remember them this morning. Please bless those who are suffering and dying for staying faithful to you, Lord. Lord, there is so much pain and suffering in the world we see conditions worsening in many places every day. Strengthen these folks, Lord. Strengthen them, give them faith and hope in you. And Lord, there are individuals listed in our bulletin this morning, this afternoon, that, and others that are not mentioned in our bulletin who need a special blessing today. Whatever it is, Lord, whether it be health, loss, discouragement, worry and doubt, family issues, whatever it is, Lord, you have the answer, and only you have the answer. Heal them, Lord, and encourage them this, today. And Lord, with the school year about to begin, we pray for our children and for our teachers. We think of our own school right here in Beltsville. We pray for our children at Tacoma Academy and Shenandoah Valley Academy and Sligo and JNA and Spencerville and Pine Forge and Highland View. I could go on, Lord. Bless our children, our youth, our young people. Uh, wherever they are attending, uh, here and around the world. Please bless our children, Lord. And Lord, we can't forget our pathfinders this morning who are at Ashkosh. Thank you for the blessing that they have had this week. Thank you for the safety. Thank you for the programs that they have been exposed to. Bless them, and I pray that they will come back changed. They will be coming back tomorrow, Lord, and I pray that you would give them a very safe journey. We pray, Lord, for our pastors today and for our former pastors. In a special way, I pray that you will speak to us through Pastor Consuegra. May his words bring us light and courage that we need today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for hearing every prayer. In your holy name I pray, amen.
Okay, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, boys and girls. It's time for the children's story. Can I please have all the boys and girls come forward? All right, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, mommies and daddies. Okay, we got two more people coming. Come on over. Okay, I got a very interesting story for you this morning. Can you guess what it's about? It's got to do something with the bag here, right? Do we all like to get gifts from people and presents? Okay. Sometimes not everything that we see is what it is or what it appears to be. Sometimes not everything that looks nice is nice inside. I'm going to ask Terry, right? Eve? Okay, I'm going to ask Eve. I'm going to have her as one of my volunteers, even though she didn't know it. Um, Can you read what's on this gift here? Free gift to all the people. Can you open it? Can you guess what's inside? Is this something nice? What what do you think is inside? Uh, it could be anything. Okay, rip it open and see. You can tear it open. It's here, right? Yeah. Okay, we have no idea what's inside, and this is what life is all about sometimes. Things look nice on the outside, but in a minute we're going to find out what we have inside the box. What does that say on the front? Not that part, just up here. Bird den? Okay, burdens. So we had a nice little pretty box, but this is filled with burdens. And I'll have Eve open the box and take out any two of those burdens and just read any two. War, more bills? Okay. Those are some of the burdens we face in life. Um, we have bills, no jobs, um, a whole lot of other things, high taxes, illness, plenty of homework for you in school. Let's just put that in here. Okay, put, put, put that back, put that back. Okay, but boys and girls, these are some of the burdens we have in life. As we grow older, some of these things tend to weigh us down. But Jesus has always said, if we have a problem, there's nothing that he cannot fix for us, isn't it? Have you ever tried asking Jesus to take our burdens for us? Boys and girls, have you ever asked Jesus to take the burdens away from us? How do you think we can do that? By praying. Okay, I have another bag over there. I want one person, I want a boy this time. Ryan, I've got, can you help me get that blue bag? And there's a reason for this. Okay, there's a blue bag. And we're talking about burdens today. There's a little blue bag over there. Can you bring it for me, please? Are you strong enough to bring it? And again, it signifies the burdens we bear in life. I'm sorry to his parents to do this. <laughs> okay. That was heavy, was it? It wasn't heavy? It's a strong boy. <laughs> okay. Okay, but this here also be- um, signifies the burdens that we bear in life. And sometimes we ask Jesus, we pray to Jesus to take these burdens off of us. And when the burdens are lifted, um, since you lifted the bag up, can you take 
put your hand in and take out what's in there. What's oh. in the bag? Okay, sometimes when the burdens are lifted, there are nice things behind that or underneath that. And as we can see here, there's something pretty inside the bag. Um, signifies the blessings we get when uh, we take our problems to Jesus. We ask him to pray for us and take those blessings away from us, the burdens away from us, and he gives us blessings. And the last thing, boys and girls, I need one person who has prayed to Jesus this morning to take his burdens or her burdens away. You did? Okay, can you open this bag up and we see what happens when we give our burdens, when Jesus takes our burdens away for us? Open, open it all the way across. Oops, <laughs> malfunction. All right, but that's what happens with our burdens when we give them to Jesus. He takes them away from us, and um, we're left with a smile. Okay, boys and girls, so next time you have school is starting this week, so we're going to have issues with homework, waking up early, eating our breakfast quickly so we can get in the car and get to school on time. So, you know, we don't eat breakfast, wow. Okay, but these are some of the little burdens we bear as boys and girls, and as we grow older, things continue to weigh on us. But we're going to pray to Jesus, and all these little burdens, he lifts them off of us and frees us. Can I get somebody to pray for us this morning? Okay. Can we close our eyes, boys and girls? Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you, Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Have a nice Sabbath and have a great school term. So 4,000 people came out to see Jesus speak that particular day. And uh, they had actually been sitting there with Jesus, listening to him talk for three days and had had nothing to eat. Uh, that's a good preacher <laughs> right there. Uh, and Jesus said this in, in Mark chapter 8. He said, I have compassion for the crowd because, because they have been with me now for three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they'll faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples were looking at Jesus and saying, well, that's nice. But then they said this, how can one feed these people with bread here in the middle of the desert? I mean, that's a pretty good question. How are you going to feed 4,000 people with bread in the middle of the desert? And what Jesus said next struck me, particularly this week. He said, how many loaves do you have? Have you ever looked around and seen a problem? Have you ever looked around and seen a need and then looked up at God and said, how is this ever going to get better? You know, Jesus responds with a question, and he says, how many loaves do you have? What do you have to give? And when the disciples gave Jesus what they had, he multiplied it and met the needs of all 4,000 of those people that had been gathered there that day. I encourage you this morning as you look out in your own lives for the needs that you see around you to just give what you have, whatever that may be, however small it may be in comparison to the needs that you see, and have faith that God will bless your gift and bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the blessings you've given us. Thank you so much for putting resources in, your, in our hands. And thank you so much for calling us to give those back to you so that we might be a blessing to those around us. In the name of your son, we pray and we thank you. Amen.
several months ago, Pastor Kerm had called and asked if I would be willing to speak one Sabbath somewhere between uh, June and September. And uh, I gave him a date, which happens to be today, because I knew we would be home today, because it's our wedding anniversary. So we on purpose did not travel uh, on today being our 33rd wedding anniversary. So we're... <laughs> Pam, my wife, was here for first service, but uh, she went home to make sure that I had lunch ready by the time I get there. So it's always good to have a good wife who thinks about those kinds of things. Mary, uh, I don't know, Mary Ballard, I don't know if you remember one time I went on a field trip with your class because Pam was a student teacher with you. And if you remember anything about me, I was very slim. I think I weighed about 120 pounds when my wife and I got married. And 33 years later, now she's saying, you need to lose weight. But it's her fault, obviously. So as we look at the second service, I'm thinking uh, the title of my message, Don't Be Late for Dinner. And you might be thinking, well, it all depends on how long you preach. You know? There's a story in the Gospels, a well-known story to all of us. In fact, it's so well-known that it has lost its original impact on all of us. And so this morning, I'd like to share it with you from a different angle and see if you, can, if, if you can figure out what this story is. Feeling footloose, fancy free, and frisky, this feather-brained fellow finagled his fond father into forking over his fortune. Forthwith, he fled for foreign fields and frittered his farthings, feasting fabulously with fair-weather friends. Finally, fleeced by those folly-filled fellows and facing famine, he found himself a feet flinger in a filthy farm lot. He fain would have filled his frame with forage food from fodder fragments. Fooey, my father's flunk is fair far fancier than uh, the frazzle fugitive fume feverishly, frankly facing fact. Frustrated from failure and filled with forebodings, he fled for his family, Falling at his father's feet, he floundered forlornly. Father, I have flunked and fruitlessly forfeited further family favors. But the faithful father, forestalling further flinching, frantically flagged his flunkies to fetch forth the finest fatling and fix a feast. But the fugitive's fall finding fratter, faithfully farming his father's fields for free, frowned at this fickle forgiveness of former fault arrow. His fury flashed, but fussing was futile. His foresighted father figured, such filial fidelity's fine, but what forbids fervent festivities? The fugitive is found, unfurl the flax. With fanfare flaring, let fun, frolic, and frivolity flow freely, former failures forgotten, and folly forsaken. Forgiveness forms a firm foundation for future Fortitude. I always take my chances when I do that because English is my second language and I get tongue twisted just speaking regular English, much more all those F's. But did you figure out what that story was? It's the parable of the prodigal son, or as the title suggests, the final fixing of the foolish fugitive. It's a different way of looking at the same thing from a different angle, uh, the same story from a different angle. And sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes we need to look at the same old thing in a different way so that we can be captured by it again, so that we can understand it differently. There's an unusual painting that hangs in the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. My daughter, when she was teaching there in Dallas, 
Uh, now she teaches at Tacoma Academy. But when she was teaching there in Dallas, we went to see her and wanted to go to the Dallas Museum of, Museum of Fine Arts because I've seen this picture on the internet. I'd seen it in books, but I hadn't seen the actual painting. And it's a painting by Thomas Hart Benton. In the painting, a man stands by the side of an empty road and scratches his graying beard. Beside him is a suitcase tied together with two pieces of rope. He looks across a road at a house, a home which had been long abandoned, gray wooden walls collapsing against themselves in a tangle of broken wood, the roof falling in. In one corner of the painting lies the bleached skull and skeleton of a cow, bones drying under a tortured, unforgiving sky. The painting itself is mysterious enough, but it is the title of the painting that at first mystifies us. You see, Thomas Hart Benton called the painting The Prodigal Son. Now, it may take us a minute before we realize what the artist was doing. This is indeed the prodigal son. The prodigal son come home for dinner at last, but come home too late, far too late. What was home was, uh, has, has become an abandoned house. His estranged family is dead or gone. The fatted calf is a pile of bleached bones in the corner of the canvas. He returned home too late. He took too long to come to his senses. It took him too long to head home. The parable of the prodigal son has been a, a favorite of artists over the years. There's a Chinese version and an African version. There are several versions from classical painters and some from some more modern, modern painters. And I have to confess, I don't really care too much for the more modern ones. They, they don't seem to say as much to me as some of the others. There's, always, there's one that I always liked, maybe because my mother had it in the living room. It was her favorite one. You probably recognize this one. Everyone seems to be enjoying the moment. Even the little dog there is happy to see the son come back home. And there's one that is my favorite of them all from my favorite painter, Rembrandt, which he entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son. You probably remember seeing this rendition of the story. The master of light and shadows portrays his son, humbly kneeling at his father's feet. The father warmly embraces him, and in the shadows in the background stands his brother. He doesn't want to come in. The shadows of the painting reflect the shadows in his heart. Other artists have painted their versions of the parable, but nobody ever painted it like Thomas Hart Benton. The prodigal son come home too late. Because I've been a volunteer hospice chaplain for several years, I was occasionally asked to officiate at the funeral services of people I didn't know very well. Some of my patients I got to spend sometimes weeks and months with them until they died, but there were some of the patients that I barely got to see once, and yet because they didn't have a religious affiliation or a church family, they would ask the hospice chaplain if he would have the funeral for their loved one. Sometimes I asked to officiate at those funerals, and so, People, uh, because I didn't know them too well, I wanted to get to know them better. And I always insisted on spending some time with the family a day or two before the service. I don't like generic funeral services. And so therefore, I didn't want to just simply talk about life and hope and eternal life and all those things. I wanted to talk about that individual and their contribution to the family's life and the memories which connect us one generation to the other. And so in the gathering, I asked the people gathered there to remember the person who had died and to share their memories with me so that I could gain a sense of, of the person and say something non-generic about them during the service. I often heard the most wonderful things. Sometimes I heard the saddest things. But I heard nothing sadder than those memories often spurted out in, in tears. Memories of a family breach that was never bridged. Memories of an all hurt still unhealed. Some ancient anger that still burned. Remembrances of a slight, an insult, some wayward behavior, an estrangement that has lived on and on until it was just too late. Time and again, folks confess that they always wanted to patch it up. They'd been waiting for the right time to say, I'm sorry. They would tell me they were waiting for an opportune time to reach out to the one who was wounded. Sometimes it's hard to know what to say at the funeral, so I usually didn't mention any of those sad things. What would be the point? 
but he still hanged there like, a, like an unseen Paul in the funeral parlor, the prodigal who never came home, the welcome hug, hug that was never extended when some prodigal did wander home, the apology that went unspoken for decades, the initiative that was met coolly when finally uttered. Stubborn pride often glows in these memories. Pride and anger like a hot coal in the hand. When I was 15, I went with my mother to visit a man whose wife, a friend of the family, had passed away of a massive stroke. I remember some of the parts of the story. Apparently, they were going on vacation, and when they got to the airport, she collapsed. They took her to the hospital, and they pronounced her death from this massive stroke. I remember the house. It was somewhat Dark. I don't know if it was the time of day or maybe because the story was so gloomy that it kind of cast shadows on the environment. But what I remember specifically was what he told us. He said that a year before his wife died, their teenage son had had, had a disagreement with his parents and he walked out of the house vowing to never come back. And since then, they hadn't heard from him. One year. And with, with great agony in his voice, he told us how he longed for him to come back, but also how he feared the day his son would come back. And he had to tell him that while he, was gonna, while he was away, his mother had passed away. The prodigal come home to find his mother dead and gone. The prodigal come home too late. Of course, in Jesus' story, the prodigal does come home in time. In Jesus' story, his father does run out to greet him. In fact, in Jesus' story, the father embraces him even before the kid can speak his well-rehearsed apology. And there is a great party, and the fatted calf does become a feast rather than sun-dried bones. We know that story so well. In fact, maybe we know it too well. Maybe we have grown too comfortable with it. But the truth is that this story has a sharp edge. I need to tell you, even though we love this story, I'm not sure that the people, that the crowd that Jesus told it to particularly liked it. You need to remember that to ask your inheritance when your father was still living was in those days the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead, Dad, so I could have all that belongs to me. Your being alive is a stumbling block. I can't get my money because you're standing in the way. I wish you were dead. And that to them was shocking to hear as it is to us. And then the kid squanders the money in a frenzy of loose living, which Jesus discreetly avoids relating with much detail. The kid ends up a slave feeding someone else's pigs. A Jewish boy taking care of unclean pigs. And then his motivation for going home around uh, rather sounds to me kind of self-serving. There is no hint that the kid really feels any remorse. Going home is not much more than a good bet. At least I can be treated as a servant and my father takes care of his servants better than I am doing here. He reasons to himself how many of my father's hard hands have bread enough and to spare. And this indulgent, his indulgent father rushes out of the house before the kid has a chance to mumble his his stilted and not very credible apology. Don't have to say anything, boy. Come back. I'm still your father. I still love you. Just I'm glad that you're back. And then, of course, there's his poor brother, the oldest, who does everything just right and never gets a single party thrown in his ever-loving honor. My guess is that at least some of Jesus' listeners frowned their way through the story. Didn't care too much for it. My guess is that they frowned their brows at the end of the tale. No applause. No, amen, Jesus, that was a great story. I loved it. More like, what are you talking about? Rather, more discomfort than comfort in the congregation. But all these years, 
You and I know this story so well that it has lost that sharp edge. It's become easy to hear. It's become a comfortable story of confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. It's like a nice little bedtime story that we love to tell children or adults. It just has a sweet taste, sweet sound to it. Some time ago, I read a modern prodigal son story that I have to confess I didn't like very much at first. It made me uncomfortable. When I read it, I have to admit that I didn't know quite what I would have done if I had been one of its characters. And I want to share that story with you this afternoon. Some years ago, New York Magazine invited readers to submit for publication what they call True Tales of New York. One reader, a woman named Gloria Gonzalez, said it, said it, uh, sent in this sharp-edged tale of a prodigal. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what Gloria Gonzalez wrote. You grow up fast in Spanish Harlem, especially if your parents are the supers of the building, the superintendents of the building. You see a lot of FBI agents looking for the former tenant, welfare case workers lurking in the alley trying to catch a father visiting, the bill collectors posing as relatives. There are also the good times, the open house parties every Friday night and after cashing the paycheck. One long-awaited celebration was the night that Jose was due home after three years as a United States Marine. Every family had contributed a home-cooked dish and a dollar for the beer and soda. Neighbors began decorating the apartment with crepe paper and balloons the night before, and someone was dispatched to the local funeral home to borrow folding chairs. The day of the party, relatives arrived from the Bronx and from as far away as San Juan, Puerto Rico. Papo, Jose's cousin, and I were posted on the stoop as lookouts. A taxi arrived and deposited its passenger. Papo and I paid scant attention to the tall brunette in the -the off-the-shoulder blouse and billowing skirt. It wasn't until she screamed out our names and swept us off the ground in a crushing hug that we realized that the perfume woman was Jose. In a daze, we lugged her suitcase up two flights, our eyes fixed on Jose's ankles strapped in stiletto heels as he took the stairs two at a time while urging us to hurry. With the music of Tito Puente in the background, Jose threw open the door and announced, I'm home! The needle was pulled on Tito Puente. Me, Jose, the person has not changed, only the outside. You are my family and I love you every one of you. If you want me to go, I will go and not be angry. But if you find it in your heart to love Josefina, I would love to stay. No one spoke. Everyone stared. Those who didn't speak English waited for the translation. Even the outside city noises seemed to halt abruptly. I stood in the open doorway, holding the suitcase, not daring to enter. After what seemed hours, but it could only have been moments, his mother stumbled forward and said to her son, Are you hungry? I was 11. It was the best party I ever went to. I still don't know whether I like that story, which is just why I felt I had to tell it to you. I said it, I said I found it, I found it discomforting, which is exactly why it deserves a place in this message, because you see, I don't think that the folks who heard Jesus' parable of the prodigal found that a very likable tale either. I doubt that it was comforting in their ears any more than Josefina come home from the Marines is exactly comforting in our ears. The truth is, 
There is a sharp edge to both stories. The sharp edge is the risk you have to take sometimes in order to go home. The sharp edge is the risk you have to take to admit your mistakes. The sharp edge is the risk you have to take to forgive. Jesus' prodigal son took a risk, a rather calculated risk, gutsy and scary, but he was home in time for dinner. His father risked grace, grace. he risked love, he risked forgiveness at the very sight of his son just walking in the right direction. Jose, Josefina took a stunning emotional risk by bouncing into that homecoming party as her scandalous self. His mother risked grace and acceptance when she invited him to stay. The kind of love Jesus pulls us toward has a sharp edge to it. His is the kind of love that risks coming home as you are. His is the kind of love that risks a radical forgiveness. His is the kind of love that risks, in spite of it all, acceptance. His is the kind of love that risks open arm grace, risk an embrace offered even before any words are out of the kid's mouth. I guess that the other prodigal the one in Thomas Hart Benton's painting in Dallas took a long time to be able to risk it. In fact, he took too long. And now he stands by the side of an empty road and scratches his graying beard. Beside him is a suitcase tied together with two pieces of rope. He looks across a road at a house, a home which has been long abandoned, gray wooden walls collapsing against themselves in a tangle of broken wood, the roof falling in. And there in the corner lies the bleached skull and skeleton of a cow, bones drying under a tortured, unforgiving sky. Well, Jesus' prodigal was home in time for dinner. Jose, Josefina, was home in time for dinner. In fact, the only one person in either of these stories that doesn't make it home for dinner is it, it, the one brother. At the end of Jesus' parable of, parable of the prodigal son, the older brother, remember him? The older brother is still outside the party. His arms crossed, his jaw firmly set. He's watching the festivities dancing in the light of the courtyard, but he never goes in. Jesus leaves him standing there, never saying how long. He just stands there, outside, stands there. So very right and sure that he is right. My church family, don't be late for dinner. Young people, don't be late for dinner. You may be late for your graduation, although I don't advise it. You may be late for your graduation and still get your diploma. You may be late for a job interview and still get the job. You may be late for your wedding and still get married. You may be late at the airport and still catch a plane to your destination. But when it comes to your appointment with God, no matter what, don't be late for dinner. The Father still anxiously waiting for you. Don't be late for dinner. No matter what causes you to stumble and fall, don't be late for dinner. No matter what you have done, what baggage you carry from your past, don't be late for dinner. No matter what mistakes have stained your life, don't be late for dinner. Listen to these words from one of my favorite authors. Arise and go to your father. He will meet you a great way off if you take even one step toward him in repentance. He will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after God is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after God is cherished, however feeble. But the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it, even before the prayer is uttered or the yearning of the heart made known. Grace from Christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working on the human soul. Don't be late 
for dinner. Don't let anything keep you from that appointment. Take all the steps you must to make things right with others and with God. Don't be late for dinner. Jesus calls you today with his arms wide open. The Father waits for you. Don't be late for dinner. Let's stand and sing together hymn number 101, Children of the Heavenly Father. We're going to sing the first and last stanzas of hymn number 101, Children of the Heavenly Father. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gather, nestling where no star in heaven is a refuge there was given. Though He giveth or be taken, God his children never forsaketh is the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. God, for a long time you've been waiting for us. The banquet table is ready, set. Our space is reserved, paid for by Jesus Christ himself. And you, our God and Father, are waiting for us. We've turned our backs on you so often, so much, that that seems to be the only side you see. And yet when we turn to you, we see your face, for you never turn away from us. Father, we are the prodigals. We have rejected you and your gifts for us, and yet you are also the prodigal father who richly provides love, acceptance, and forgiveness to every one of us. So today, Father, as we stand, we want to accept that invitation for dinner. We're sending you our hearts as an RSVP. We want to be there. We look forward to being there. And we don't want to be late for that dinner. For being late means we will miss it all together. Accept our RSVP, accept our response. Come soon, Lord Jesus, so we can sit together at your banqueting table. Amen.